Joan Dubinsky, and I am a somewhat retired business ethicist. I've worked at the American Red Cross, at Arthur Anderson, at the MITRE Corporation, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the International Monetary Fund, BAE Systems, and my final position was as the Chief Ethics Officer at the United Nations. We got ethics on the map. By this I mean we were able to establish that the UN Oath of Office has deep ethical value for how it guides the right kind of behavior, the behavior that is expected of international civil servants. We launched the first ever ethical risk assessment for the UN, focusing on UN peacekeeping. We began to make it okay to talk about whistleblowing and retaliation, make it okay to talk about ethical culture. And we began uh, a management cascade ethical outreach and training program that continues to today. So we got it on the map. I have an undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan in religious philosophy. And then I moved to Austin, Texas. And on a dare, I enrolled in the law school and they accepted me. So I have a law degree from the University of Texas. And I thought that I would be an employment and labor lawyer and perhaps return home to St. Louis to go into private practice with my grandfather and my father. Well, that didn't happen. They both passed on. And I was in Austin, Texas, working for the city of Austin as a political or a political hack, as a, an assistant city attorney, and realized after about five years that it was time to move on. I applied to a blind ad in a newspaper. This is long before the internet. And got a response from the American Red Cross inviting me to come to Washington, D.C. for an interview. I said, certainly. Interviewed, and lo and behold, was selected moved across country and became an assistant, uh, an assistant general counsel and ultimately the corporate secretary for the American Red Cross. So some of the big questions in the sphere of ethics and international organizations, there are many, many, many of them. Um, I'll start with one, which is how do they build relationships with implementing partners? How do they distinguish implementing partners from donors and funders? And where are the ethical lapses, the potential for major or significant ethical risk that comes around when you don't have control over the other entities with whom you have to partner to make a big project successful? We, we were speaking earlier about the Sustainable Development Goals. The 17 SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, even themselves say that number 17 is about partner, partnering. You can't do it alone. SDGs take us from 2015, August 1, 2015, through July 30, August 1 of 2030. So in this 15-year period, we have a group of universally created and universally adopted by all governments who are members of the UN system, that's 193 nations, agree that in order to address the most significant development goals that we have around the globe, we agree that these are the focuses, the foci. We agree that these are the measures to know whether we've done it and more importantly, these are the actions that we believe collectively, collectively, if we take, will reach those goals. So rather than saying end poverty, which is what the prior set of goals called the millennial, Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals say not just end poverty, but to ensure that people are lifted up out of what's called abject or extreme poverty, living on what's in today's market less than a dollar and fifty cents a day. Part of the eradicating poverty is also to improve health outcomes. 
whether they are maternal mortality, universal health care, access to life-saving drugs, fighting HIV, tuberculosis, and malaria, ensuring vaccination programs are available and sustainable, and not the focus of uh, either conspiracy theories or violence that interfere with the delivery of life-saving vaccinations for children. So we move from lofty goals to pretty pragmatic development-focused goals for which we have 193 nations who've said, yes, we agree. The case study method is the right way to teach ethics, that people need to engage with real cases, real challenges that sound like them from their own milieu. I think we've established and we no longer have controversies over codes of conduct and codes of ethics are not the same as policies. We've established that you need an internal justice system, an internal investigations and grievance system that is fair, prompt, thorough, independent, and impartial. I think we've established that hotlines and helplines really do work around the globe. That there are reasons why you have to encourage people to speak up, but if you provide adequate protections, you'll hear about a problem before it becomes the bad headline. And it's a lot easier to fix at the beginning. I think we're still struggling about the true added value of ethics and compliance programs. Is this really a subset of audit or a part of the practice of law? I think we're still not certain about that. I don't think we really have navigated what are the standards for a successful ethics and compliance program. We know if we look at the field of internal audit, what a good assurance and oversight program looks like. But do we have that in the ethics and compliance field? And do we have that in a way that is, I wouldn't say divorced, but above the operation of individual national law, because so many organizations are global. So I think those are some of the challenges that we are facing.